Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have back in the studio, Matt Pesh. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Matt, I'm very excited to have you on because our listeners should know before the show we were talking and Matt is going to walk us through the money operation at the Flag Land Base, Clearwater, Florida. Matt, by the time somebody, uh, a pre-clear, an OT, someone shows up at the Flag Land Base, the Flag Base is already primed to get all their money. How does that work? Okay, let me give you a a whole overview of this. First of all, you got to realize that there are multiple registration or sales units in Clearwater, Florida at the flag at the flag base. And each of these are run separately and they each have pressure to get money from the public. And I'll run through so have, go ahead. These are all different sales departments if you will. Yeah, you know, they're not even underneath the same uh small church or underneath the same captain, you know, like they're individual separate entities. Okay, and just for our listeners, for simplicity, we're going to call Flag Land Base Flag. Okay. And for people not familiar with Scientology, salespeople within the Church of Scientology are called regs. That's short for registrars. But just so our listeners know, Flag is the Flag Land Base and regs are salespeople. And Matt, it's correct to say that they've been trained in high-pressure sales. Oh, yeah. And the salesperson is called Les Dane, mm-hmm. D-A-N-E. And L. Ron Hubbard embraced Les Dane and was in the 1960s. Right. And he built high-pressure sales closing techniques into the church. So with that premise, Matt, tell us about the sales departments at Flag. Okay, so let me explain some of the different units there so you can kind of get the overall picture. First of all, you have the flag service organization, which is called FSO, which is the uh, part of the church that delivers Scientology counseling and courses at uh, in Clearwater. Then you have flag crew, which uh, is responsible for the Scientology hotels and restaurants and getting money for those. Then you have the IAS, which is the International Association of Scientologists, which collects money for what it calls its war chest, the church's like slush fund that they can use for whatever they deem is necessary to keep the church doing well. Then you have stuff like the superpower building. Uh, now that they've you know done the, completed that building, they're collecting money for some kind of new event hall that's going to be built in uh, Clearwater. Yeah, and that would be the LRH Auditorium. That's right. Okay, so. What's the next one? Okay, next one would be uh, Scientology Missions International. They call it, you know, for short, it's SMI. Uh, it's a, its own little beautiful scam, which I won't cover in detail right now. We can do it at a different time. Next, you have uh, translation of the tech, preservation of the tech. You have uh, uh, Narconon and Criminon. You have the Way to Happiness campaign. You have Books to Libraries. These are just a few of them. They all have their own offices, and the public, when they arrive, they have a, a routing form that takes them through each one of these different registration units, believe it or not. They have to go through each one and have every one of these, these units sign them off as they, the, you know, the public got briefed, and the registrars had basically a chance to uh, introduce themselves and to go in for money at some point while the person is going to be staying at FLAG. So, Matt, you have given me nine, you've given me nine sales departments, flag service organization, flag crew, IES, the uh, superpower building, which is now the LRH Auditorium, SMI, which is Missions International. Then we have CST, which does translations, archival, Narconon, the way to happiness, and books for libraries. Right. Now, this is amazing, and by the routing form, when a person arrives at FLAG, they've got to see nine different regs for money. Yep, and they have to see those same people on the departure routing form. Really? On the way out? Yep, on the way out again. Talk about uh, gutting and stripping. This is uh, mind-bending. Okay, so you go to FLAG to get, say, your L's or an OT level or something. That is paying FSO, correct? That's right. Now, once you run the gauntlet of the regs on the way in, what happens to you next? Well, you've got to realize that um, the rule is that the 
the FSO that you know sells the Scientology services and Flat Crew that gets money for the hotel rooms and the food, they get first shot at the public. And until they get their chance to take money from the public, all the other units have to kind of stand by and not take any money yet. So the the sharks are kind of lined up, and <laughs> FSO and Flat Crew get first first bite. Yeah. All right, and then okay. before that public arrives, you know, there's a unit called the call-in unit in uh, in uh, the FSO, and they schedule public to arrive weeks or months ahead of time. That's all written down, it's all logged, and the registrars get to see who's going to be arriving. And it's these sheets are printed out; they're called the arrival sheets, and uh, that sheet will be taken. They'll have a little meeting. Like the regis will sit there, they'll initial which of the public are their public. If they've dealt with a public before that's arrived before, that public is theirs forever. Like no other reg in the FSO will will have that public. It's already like owned by the registrar that was originally assigned that public. Right. So then on that list, you're going to have people who have never been to flag before. They're they're first time arrivals. Okay. And these people. It's, it was known when I worked there that each of those people, on an average, will pay fifty thousand dollars before they leave. That's fifty thousand is an average. Yep, an average. Wow. So the 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 red drop, they want that person assigned to them in a big way, obviously. No kidding. And uh, a lot of how that's divided out, who gets who, is based on which registrar per Les Dane's Big League Sales Book, which one would be best to get the most money from that public who's going to be arriving. In other words, regis specialize in uh, regis specialize in, in their particular sales pitches. Yeah, like say a, a woman who's not married is going to arrive. Per big league sales, she's called the unattached female, and she's most likely to listen to a strong male who will kind of direct her on what she should do. So a strong male type figure will be assigned to her as her reg. That is amazing. And what are the other types? Uh, let's see. There was the uh, professional buyer. This kind of person, <laughs> they want to know all the facts and figures. I mean, literally, they would sit there with a little adding machine and just make that tape kind of flow off the desk. This person wants to know, you know, if they buy this many intensives and they do it this way and they do it that way and how it will affect their taxes and can they combine this package and take this money off their account that they had already had there. And they just work this crap back and forth until this guy's like, Ugh, you know, the professional buyer, you know, feels like he's really got the deal and he wants to buy it. Wow. Uh, let's see. Another one is the family buyer. And this is the person who – is most concerned about his family, his kids, this kind of thing. So you got to sell him in a way that it makes him see that by you know paying his money out, he's going to actually improve his family and his relationships within his family. So these are really just closing techniques. Right, exactly. Each of the sales rooms have a listening system. And in the room off to the side where the public can't see, there is the director of registration, and he's the overall salesperson. He's listening in on all these sales conversations. And if that <laughs> registrar isn't doing a good job or whatever, and it looks like he's not going to get the close, there'll be somebody else that'll be sent into that room to tag on that because they don't want this guy to leave without paying you know, the maximum amount that they can get out of him. Matt, this is crazy. This is like used car sales or, you know, automotive dealerships where you got the sales manager listening into the little rooms you go into. Yep. And I know, and I don't know if it's legal anymore in California, but it, it used to be that they would put, uh, you know, mom and dad going to buy the car, right? right. And the salesman would go, please wait in the room. I'm going to get the boss. Now, the boss would be listening in to mom and dad talking. Exactly. Oh, oh, honey, can we afford this? And they would get all the objections. Right. Is, does that go on at flag? Completely. And the intelligence gathering on these people before they arrive on what their problems are in life, uh, you know, what their financial information is, where they have money invested, how, you know, if they have a big boat, like whatever, you know, what their business is worth, you know, maximum financial information, maximum personal information is gathered on these people. A lot of this stuff is fed in by what's called a flag, um, the FSM, field staff member is what it's, it is, FSM. And it kind of rounds up Scientologists and, and makes friends with them and says, you know, I'm going to help get you – uh, through your services faster, and you know, so I'm going to be your FSM. And he puts in a sales slip 
to flag saying that he gets a commission for everything this person pays when he comes to flag. Meanwhile, he's feeding over as much information as he can to the registrars so that they can get more money out of this person so he gets a bigger commission. In other words, let's just say we're both Scientologists, right? right. And I'm, I'm Jeff. I'm your friend, Matt. Right. But I'm also a field staff member, so I'm going to secretly gather intelligence on how much money you have, uh -huh. property you own, your business, your net worth, what your buttons are. Right, exactly. In order, in order to optimize my commission from Flag Land Base, I'll spy on you. Exactly. And so that when you arrive at Flag, they know exactly what kind of uh, people to put into play. You got it. And, th and these top uh, FSMs, the ones that do it full time, the big time guys, they'll make 500 to a million dollars a year commissions. Are you five hundred thousand to a million a year? Yep. I had no idea. Oh yeah, Matt. This is. I'm glad you said it because this goes exactly to the heart of the matter. There are vested interests inside the Church of Scientology. There are people who have ulterior motives, and they don't want the system to change. That's for sure. They and these these field staff members who are knocking down the big money, they don't want it to change. Right. If they can make even more money, they'll do it. But what does that say about the type of person who's a field staff member who will collect intelligence on their own friends and associates? The sharks. No kidding. They're complete uh, sharks. <laughs> okay, so now once the, the information is fed up lines and you get to flag and you run the gauntlet of regis, I mean, that's got to be... That's got to really be discouraging, wanting to go to flag for spiritual advancement and then going through nine regs or more who know exactly what to look for. Well, here's the next thing that the person runs into that arrives. He thinks he's going to, you know, flag is supposed to be the best technically, and they're going to, you know, study their folders and help, you know, uh, give them the best counseling possible that's really directed to what they need and blah, 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 right? Correct. But what happens very often is... The, uh, what they're told they need technically is dictated, if not entirely typed out, written by the registrar based on what money that person can potentially pay. So the services are geared to get the maximum money out of that person. It has nothing to do with what they need technically. So the so-called tech estimate is really driven by the regs. Completely. And if, if somebody uh, outside the reg area a technical person or somebody else steps in the way or crosses the line or does something to ruin that money cycle, they will be stomped on. I mean, the registrar is the king. They, you know, they got, they own, they're the, the lions of the den, you know. So a case supervisor, if he or she says, well, their tech estimate is 50000 but the person has a hundred grand available, right. then the reg will make sure that the tech estimate's $100,000. Exactly. That's uh, that's very cynical, and something that's important for people to know is, and this is a data point when you do data collection analysis, I'm here looking at eBay, and the um, books written by Les Dane, they begin at 100, $175 and go down. These uh, titles, sales closing techniques, surefire sales closing techniques, strike at rich sales prospecting, these books are still very much in demand by people who use hard sell. Mm -hmm. And so make no mistake about it, this is a hustle, a con, a way to close people. And if this, the tech estimate is really driven by how much money a person has, that's such bad faith. Mm -hmm. But it goes on all the time. Yeah. What are some of the other tricks, all right, here's, techniques? Check this out. There's a, there's a book, a log book, in the registration office, and it's called the, the GI or Gross Income Log Book. When a registrar gets a person to confirm or pay a certain amount of money that week, he goes right from talking to the public. As soon as the public leaves, they'll walk into the director of registration's office, who's been listening in all the time, and write into the log book the person's name and how much they either paid or have promised to pay that week. Because there's so much competition between reg units on the, on the property, if there's somebody who's paying a lot of money, many times they'll put a false name in there and then put the amount of money 
because they don't want to put the person's real name because when they, the registrars go to lunch or they go to sleep at night, these other red units will try to sneak in sometimes and get a hold of that book to see which public have a lot of money. To pay. <laughs> <laughs> so they're stealing each other's uh, prospects. They steal them, and they also trade them. Like you got to realize some of these big, like, you know, Charmaine, she's, she's getting money for the superpower building or now the, the, uh, the new auditorium. You know, maybe it's close to the end of the week. She's having a bad week. It's a bit slow. She doesn't have really ideas where she's got to get some big money. She might go over to one of the big regs like Sonia in the flag service organization and say, you know, throw me a bone, basically. You know, give me give me a tip. Where can I get some money from? And they'll and then they'll owe a favor and they'll help her out another week. And they're kind of they'll flip back and forth information about who they can get money from, and also, like, what buttons we use to close this person. How can you actually get them to pay? How did you get them to pay? And this stuff is traded back and forth between units. Now, how do you get extra money above and beyond what they have? Well, these, these regs are experts in raising credit card limits, getting bank loans, these kind of things. You know, if the public's there and going, you know, I'm all maxed out, all my cards are maxed out, you know, boy, I sure, you know, I wish, I wish they weren't, I would, would do something else. Do they make that mistake of saying that? The regs will take their wallet or their pocketbook or whatever, pull all their cards out, and they will get them raised considerably. I guarantee it. So let's say someone's going there planning on spending 50000 they could leave having spent a hundred, hundred fifty thousand. Oh yeah. Is that uncommon? No. No, it's not. I mean, if you if somebody does all three L's, they're probably going to spend about a hundred fifty thousand. And that's just that's mind-boggling. This is tax-exempt cash. Mm -hmm. Plus, they may be on the hook to donate to some of these other groups. Oh yeah, if they come in and they get that kind of cash, you can believe it. They they will be followed around if they have a lot of money. They'll be followed around like they're a dog in the heat. I'm not even kidding. It's it's disgusting. Now, on the we were talking about uh, some of the tricks Reg uses. You describe one trick where the Reg isn't closing the sale, and then someone else comes in. Yeah, what will happen is say the, the registrar is trying to get the guy to buy some more, uh, you know, packages of counseling. You know, and it, each package, each twelve and a half hours, costs somewhere between seven thousand and twelve thousand, depends on depending on what it is that they're buying. And so the person says, listen, you know, there's no way I can buy any more. Just absolutely can't. The registrar spends a bunch of time and effort. The guy says, no, I can't. All right, so let the guy go from the office, get a hold of the, uh, the director of processing, the person that's up in the technical area, and they work this. It's like a little trick that they just use over and over again, which is basically the director of processing will take that public person and his folder and come down to the registration office, the reg already knows this is gonna happen. He's ready waiting for the, the guy to come, but he's pretending like he doesn't know it's gonna happen. And the director of processing will chew out the regs like, why is it that you will not help this person? Do you know that this person, you know, really needs this and stuff like that? And you will not help him, you know? And and slam the folder and make a big scene and, and the and the registrar will seem all kerfluffled and, you know, like got in trouble and, and then the, the director of processing will walk away and leave that public person with the registrar who looks like he's on the verge of crying or something. And then <laughs> the, the person feels really bad that they just got their registrar in so much trouble. And then they, they sit down and they, they start figuring out how they can you know get a second mortgage on their home or something like that. And it, it works over and over again, and then we'll get the money from the guy. Boy, that is just shocking, <laughs> that kind of <laughs> scammy playing on their emotions. Yeah. In your experience, what's the the if the average first person's visit is fifty grand, what's the average stay? How long do people stay at Flag? Do they go for two weeks, four weeks? You know, it depends. Um, I would say if I was going to say an average, I would say probably two weeks. Well, that's if you if you uh, work for a company, that's probably your two week vacation. Right. What I could never figure out is some people I know go to Flag for six weeks or eight weeks. Yeah, some people stay I, there for the whole year. Where do you get the time? Where do you get the money? Well, in some cases, people will uh, call their boss and get uh, an extension on a vacation, or in some cases, they will even wind up losing their job, believe it or not. They will stay there so long that they will actually lose their job, and when they leave FLAG, they have to go look for new employment. No, well, what do you, well, what do you do at FLAG when you're not in session? Is there like a social scene, or what goes on you there? You know, there used to be a social scene. Uh, Boy, like in 70s, 80s, and, you know, you could go 
to the area around the pools or outside where the, the people would wait to, to get their next session. There might be 100, 150 people, you know, reading books, talking to each other, playing checkers, singing Italian songs, all kinds of stuff. It was like a real kind of a party festival, you know. It was a, it was a real happening scene. By the time, I would say by 1990, you would be lucky. Yeah. I'm not even kidding to see three people sitting in the in the in the waiting area. One of the reasons being is one because so less public came, but two because they were afraid to sit around. Because if you sat around, one of these shark red units is going to grab you, literally grab you, and try to drag you to their office so that they can try to get money out of you. So the public would literally hide basically in their rooms if they had to stay on board. If they had to. You know, they didn't have a place they could stay off the property. They would try to hide out so that they weren't getting beat up for money all day. Well, you can't blame them. You would hide in your room. Matt, there have been stories of mysterious deaths or suicides at Flag. Do you know of any? I'll tell you one that comes to mind. When I was the, uh, when I got put on, was moved from being in charge of the renovations at Flag to the Captain Flag crew, which is over the hotels and restaurants. Um, when I got put on, Flag Crew owed almost a million dollars to outside creditors, and they were wow. in very, very, very bad financial straits. And the uh, engineers, for instance, these guys, there was only two of them at the time, and they could get almost no money through to fix any kind of equipment, you know, stuff like that. So they had a really, really poor scene as far as the engineering area went like most of the organization and they had gotten a new guy in that was uh, an older gentleman and he was like retired and his family wasn't Scientologist or anything like that he just found out about Scientology he decided to join the Sea Org and he became an engineer and he was working over in the engine room at the Sandcastle and the engineers hadn't warned him about the fact that uh, there was so much exhaust in that room that it could it could literally kill you, and the guy literally died from from the fumes in there. And uh, that's shocking. Yeah, I mean, people. It was reported as you know just a natural death, and it kind of went under the board, and hardly anybody ever knew that he really died because and he was found in the engine room where he had died from carbon monoxide poisoning. And uh, there were, of those two ridges, I mean, it was. One of them had to go to the RPI. It was kind of one of these flaps that was all kept quiet with Oster and stuff, but it was like somebody's responsible, somebody's head's got to roll. So uh, I, had, I met with the two engineers in my office and was like, okay, which one, who wants to go? To, you know, it was really pretty straight yeah, up. Somebody. somebody has to go to the RPI. Who do you get, which one do you guys want to go? And uh, Red, one of the engineers, he said he wanted to go because he had never had a chance to learn how to audit or get auditing, and he saw this as a, you know, a, a way he could do that and he went and did the RPF but yeah that, that was a death that nobody knew about. That That's just so strange that the only way uh, a Sea Org member can learn how to audit is to go to the RPF. Mm -hmm. It's really ass backwards from the way they represent the Sea Org right. that you could go up your bridge. We were talking uh, on a previous show about Lisa McPherson. I wanted to go back for that for a minute. Okay. One thing you mentioned was that uh, at the time Lisa, of Lisa McPherson's death, you had $25 million in reserves yeah. for the uh, for FSO, yep. and that was spent. Yep. Uh, it went upwards for legal fees. Mar Marty Rathbun has said that it probably cost the church $100 million to defend against charges, legal matters, in the Lisa McPherson death. Do you think that's an accurate number? Yeah, I, do. I think that's accurate because besides that $25 million, Man, I don't know how many millions we gave from our weekly income that came in. We're just going, I mean, shit. The, the year that we paid the most money towards that, that whole legal case, the crew probably got $500 total pay that year. You know, not including maybe the Christmas bonus or something. But they, it was like week after week, it'd be no pay, no pay, no pay, quarter pay, no pay. You know, it was bad. It was bad. So all the money was going to, to legal. Yep. So flag crew, how many people are in flag crew? 200. There was 200 in 1986, and when I left, there was still 200. So really, they get $500 among them for a year? That that year, 
where so much money was being taken from the financial planning uh, for the legal case, yeah, that's that's how that worked out for that year. That was how bad it was. Matt, there's uh, there's uh, several restaurants that flag, you know, uh, like in and around. Yeah. Yeah, in and around flag. I mean, you know, there's different buildings that flag. It's a complex. Uh-huh. How often do Sea Org members need to scrounge food? I mean, I've heard about that going on. They're just starving. There's food left over from Publix. You know, it's, you know, different times you have different situations. I mean, when that was happening, when the crew weren't getting paid, for week after week it, it was brought up, you know, to uh, myself from the, the finance office that it was coming up in the sec checks and the, and the write-ups of staff that they were stealing food from what's called a canteen, which is like a little uh, like a little food store within the Fort Harrison for mostly for public, you know, to get coffee or sure. snacks and stuff like that. Cigarettes, you know, so you had the, the staff were, uh, were stealing in there just so they could have, you know, some food or <laughs> cigarettes or whatever. And, you know, so it was one of the things that we kind of like, we have to figure out how to give these guys some money because of the amount of stealing that goes on between them. You also have you had such a situation for years of lack of uniforms for staff, where the staff would have holes in their, you know, have only one shirt and have a hole sure. in, the, in the elbow, and then they, you know, they had to buy their own shoes and they would go to pay less shoes and buy the plastic ones for 15 bucks because they couldn't buy the leather ones for 100 bucks, and they have holes in the bottoms, and it was it was nasty. And what would happen is when you did your laundry at the, at the staff birthing. You'd have to stay with your laundry because people would steal your uniform parts because they were so desperate to get uniform parts. If somebody went out on a project off base and they left behind uniform parts in the closet, they'd come back. Those uniform parts would be gone. Because Matt, let, Go ahead. Matt, let me jump in here. Yeah. The fact that, that you call a uniform uniform parts, what you're really talking about is shirts, pants, and shoes, shoes, and a tie. Yeah, but they're called uniform parts in the church. Right. It's an interesting description. You know, Mark Headley has talked about uniform parts. Specifically, he said he had two polyester shirts out at Gold Base in the desert. Right. And it was very common that he would wear holes in the elbows. Right. And you only have, so you, you basically have only one uniform at Flag. I mean, you have to wear it all week and then launder it on Saturday. Or how does that work? How many do you have two uniforms? Some people have one. Some people have two. I mean, it's that nasty. A lot of people will come home at night and will hand wash their shirt and then hang it up, you know, in the bathroom to drip dry and then iron it in the morning for the final, you know, moisture in it. And then that's it. They wear that and they do that day in, day out because they only have the one shirt. I mean, but don't some Sea Org members, who, let's say if they're really fatigued and they literally fall asleep in their uniform, I mean, are some Sea Org members, they have body odor? Yeah. I mean, I imagine you would develop some hygiene problems if you couldn't launder, you couldn't hand wash one uniform every day. Yeah. I mean, especially having problems with their feet because they're wearing plastic shoes 18 hours a day in Florida. I mean, it's, it, you're going to have, you're gonna have uh, fungus growing on your feet for sure. And if that developed, was there a medical handling or what, did, what do you do when you develop, say, toenail fungus or foot fungus? I mean, is there... And you don't have any money. You, just, you don't do nothing. You just suffer through yeah, it. You, you know, there's no, nobody's going to do anything for you. That's your own problem. You've got to sort it out. How do Sea Org members live at Flag? Are they in cramped birthing, like at Pack Base? Yeah, probably not as bad as Pack Base, but it's, it's cramped. You know, you, you're going to have, uh, like a normal dorm will probably have eight guys sleeping in, you know, one kind of oversized room or something. It's you know. If, here's the other problem: you get married and, and uh, you could wait six months to a year to get a space to move into with your wife. So you continue to live in men's dorm and she lives in a woman's dorm, and for six months or even a year, waiting for a room to open up at Flag when I was there. Why? Why is it so hard to give a married couple their own room? Is it just lack of rooms? Yeah, lack of rooms. The church itself owns a lot of buildings in Clearwater. Mm-hmm. They don't own an enormous amount of property, and uh, I'm, I'm surprised they would be short on rooms for their own Sea Org. Yeah, well, you got you know, Ottawa trainees. Sometimes you got 500 to 700 of those, and they're going to fill up a lot of those 
miscellaneous uh, rooms in hotels, plus you got a certain amount of those rooms need to stay open for public. And so then you kind of limit yourself to, you know, mostly that the Hacienda. You know, now I guess they got a separate uh, property that they've opened up since I left. But uh, And there's only so many rooms. And the more people get married, then dorms turn into uh, single rooms, you know. Oh, you make a good point. With five to 700 outer org trainees, that would tend to put put a big demand. On these five to 700 outer org trainees, you know, that are going to be trained and then go to orgs to make money. Yeah. What's the attrition rate at Flag in terms of people blowing or leaving? Is that a, as big of a problem as it is at Pack Base? Um, no, I don't think it was. I think a lot of the times what would happen is what I saw from you know from my perspective is a lot of these guys they would they would think they would come in to train for a few months, you know, maybe three to six months, and that would turn into three to six years. And by the time they got sent back. After being used to working at Flag, where there's a big team and a lot of activity, they return to their, you know, Seattle or St. Louis or wherever they came from, where there's, you know, 10 full-time staff and the place is a snooze and they're getting almost no pay. And these people would be forced, basically, to to leave, to leave staff to survive. And uh, so, you, you know, you think that you put all these trainees out there that's going to expand Scientology, and you, what you find is they're the same size they always were because those people don't stick there. They get trained but walk out the door just to survive, to have some kind of money, to have some kind of life. And so then they've got the same program that's run over and over and over again, and still you don't see Scientology growing. No, and that shows that the, the church's uh, horrific pay system, where they're going to pay you little or nothing, mm -hmm. It defeats the purpose of training 500 or 700 people if, if a lot of them are going to leave when they go back home. Right. And see, this is part of the irrationality of church finance policy. Mm -hmm. Because really, a, a corporation would invest in training to retain people long term. Right. So it's kind, of a, it's kind of a pointless exercise, but it does look good in the magazine to show all these outer org trainees, I guess, exactly. it, it looks for PR good. purposes. Yeah, and then the, the big whales, the guys with the big money, you know, when they're at Flag and they go to the graduation on Friday night and they see all these people going up there getting their certificates and, you know, all these students and stuff, it makes it look like it's, it's active, there's something happening, and really it's, there's nothing happening. It's just a, it's smoke and mirrors again. Would you say that, that in that respect of the way they work their money, uh, Scientology is futile? I mean, is there a futility in the Church of Scientology? What do you Does it wind up? Well, what I mean is it seems like a, an exercise in futility to begin with the premise that we're going to pay you as little as possible, demand as much work as we can, 16, 18 hours a day. Right. I mean, something I, mean, something I saw right from the beginning – when I got in and, you know, one throughout is they're always working like it's a, it's a sprint. It's a short little race. You know what I mean? They'll they try to suck every hour out of, and every ounce out of somebody. And they're not thinking of it as a long-term endeavor, you know, where like, you know, in treasury, these little folders that were kept on each person that had routed out or blown, you know, they're called freeloaders because now they're supposed to owe the org money because they took a couple of courses before they took off. I mean, it right. was thousands of these things, thousands of them. And I would look at them and go, man, can you imagine if only even 1% of those people had actually stayed in the Sea Org, how we'd have no problems with personnel and what we could do with just 1% of all those people that came through the front door and went out the back door. And they come in the front and go out the back because – of the conditions that are there, mainly, you know, it's made it almost impossible for somebody to, to actually stay there long term. Matt, that's a very revealing comment. You have thousands of files for freeloader bills, right. and these are just really people who who began with good intentions to help the Church of Scientology, or you know, they had noble aspirations. Right. Let's let's give them the benefit of the doubt. They want to help, and they wind up leaving with a freeloader bill. Mm -hmm. So not only does it hurt the Church of Scientology to recruit for the Sea Org in long term, but to your point, they're losing a lot of talent because they won't pay talent. Right. Because there's always a crisis or a phony emergency. Right. And people leave the Sea Org because of brutal treatment, no pay, sleep deprivation. That's right. So why doesn't the Church of Scientology change its operating basis? I don't know. I can never figure it out, really. And it's just, it's kind of, that's why you asked me, 
the other day whether uh, I thought the church would ever change, whatever. And it's it's kind of, I don't know, it's like the March of the Wooden Soldiers. It's like all so robotic. It just, it's plugged in and it goes that way and it doesn't seem to have a mind to be able to change the way it goes. You know, it just, it, you know, when X happens, Y gets done and it's just over and over and over again. And it's, it's ridiculous. Matt, what's interesting to me in the 1990s, the Church of Scientology, and this was David Miscavige and Kurt Weiland, right. they hired the PR giant Hill and Knowlton. Right. And basically they said to Hill and Knowlton, help us with our bad PR. Mm -hmm. So Hill and Knowlton said, well, one thing you could consider is changing what people don't like about you. Right. That is, you know disconnection, fair game, spying, harassment, freeloader bills, breaking up families. Why don't you actually try changing the way you are? And the church could not even listen to a PR giant. Right. And this is stunning because when you say it's like the March of the Wooden Soldiers, they can't change because the system doesn't allow them to change. Right. As, as an act, this is just a pure, uh, a pure exercise in imagination, if you will uh, engage me in this. Yeah. If you suddenly found yourself in charge of the Church of Scientology, what are the few things you would do to change it? I mean, the first thing you'd have to do is you'd have to really have a talk, an open talk with the public and the staff and kind of lay everything on the line and just point out that there was some things that were done that, like any organization would do if it found itself in that kind of situation, you know, they, the companies will come forward and say, you know what, we, you know, we made a mistake, you know, it, shit happens, but we've, we've, uh, we've looked at it and we're going to change it. And you just take responsibility for it and people will accept that and, you know, as long as you do make the changes, things go fine and you can start new, you can fix things up. It's only when you say, you know, you're a car salesman, a car company, and you sell cars that the wheels fall off, and people say, hey, man, my wheel fell off, and you say, no, no it didn't. You know, that car wasn't made by us. We never saw that car before. You, this kind of stuff happens. You, you, there's no way you can correct your company. You could keep, you know, a repute with, with your public if, if you will not, first of all, just be honest with them, and, and be honest. If you make a mistake, fine. You made a mistake. Fix it. Yeah, and that's, that's something Jason Begay said in his video. He, he was very morally outraged, and rightly so, that they said arbitrary is canceled. And instead of free auditing, they wanted you to pay a lot more money because they canceled their own arbitraries. <laughs> so, and I got to tell you, Jason Begay just knocked it out of the park. He really stood and delivered at a time when it was a lot more dangerous to do so. And when he roared, show me a motherfucking clear, he really threw down the gauntlet. He did. What did you think when Jason came out? I, I, I was applauding him. You know, I was like, right on. You know, it's so true. Read Dynex. See what it says it can handle and all this stuff. It gives you the perfect mind, the perfect memory. It won't get sick, blah, 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 blah. Where have you ever seen that? I mean, I worked in the Sea Org with people that came in brand new, didn't know Scientology from a hole in the wall, and people that were the top of the top, you know, had been in there for 40 years and had done every course and ordering imaginable. And really, you couldn't tell one from the other in most cases. In many cases, the new guy was more competent and more sane than the other guy. So it was like, what are you talking about? That is a remarkable statement coming from you, Matt. That really, uh, it's very, very interesting. Um, because people, when people get entrenched in a bureaucracy, many times they get worse. Right. Because they just kind of tamely submit to the fact of oppression. I'm here and there's nothing I'm going to do about it, and this is what the book says. Right. And the Sea Org, like many other bureaucracies, but probably the Sea Org is worse, tends to crush innovation and uh, bright new thinking. Right. How far did you go up on your bridge you know, in your science? I did just about everything you could pr do. I want the OT7. I audited others on everything except for the L's, pretty much that flag delivers. I did all the administration, you know, training, the, the it's called the OEC, FEBC, I did that. I, I did most of the St. Health special briefing course. I did all the mission training, you know, for how to go and get things, projects done. Uh, I mean, I did the, the uh, free wins training for officers. I mean, if you could do it, I pretty much did all their courses and training, believe me kind of chasing the carrot in all these different ways, hoping that there's going to be, you know, what's, what's been promoted or promised. And, 
and I chase those carrots all the way to the end, and I know what they are and what they aren't from my perspective. And you know, there's good things about it, but it, it's not what it's it's sold as. It's not what's promised. How would you characterize Scientology based on your vast years of experience? I think there are uh, there are definitely things within it that can help an individual, and I think. Uh, if Scientology would just say what it can and can't do, you know, it can help somebody who has an upset in life. You know, it can help reduce that upset for the person. True, it can do that. It can help a person who's having difficulty with a relationship maybe improve that relationship. Good, you know. But what's that stuff worth? It's only worth a certain amount. They, they try to get the big bucks and say, we're going to make it so you can go outside your body and, you know, have full control of a matter energy space and time you will remember all your past lives you will you know be able to walk down the street without touching the floor you know you can go exterior from your body and go to a library and read a book i mean all these crazy things and they used to put the stuff in their in their magazines and it's just bullshit it, there's nothing like that there is nothing you know the only people have ever stated something like that if you know the person you know they are insane and they are loony, and it has nothing to do with Scientology. So, um, you know, so yeah, it can do good. It can do things to help people, but it's they they don't they don't say that. You know, they don't say I got a car that can help you get to work fast. They'll say I got a car that can take you to planet Pluto, you know, and jump light years ahead of you know whatever. They'll just put it out of the zone, and then try to take instead of selling it for a hundred bucks, sell it for a hundred thousand bucks. And it's you know, and then if you don't like it, then you ain't getting your money back. And we're going to declare you and get the hell out of town. It's it's you know, it's that's bullshit. It ain't going to work. That is breathtaking what you're saying, and certainly it is true that hyperbole, exaggeration, is at the heart of Scientology. It's a marketing driven, and what's happening? The hyperbole, the hype, the false promises are breaking down. Look, I've been a critic a long time, and I have watched the drift, the pattern. Due to lawsuits, exposure, challenges, Scientology keeps having to move the goalposts. One of the most significant drifts I've seen in it backing down, well, two actually. Many years ago, due to pressure from critics, the church stopped presenting the phony L. Ron Hubbard World War II record as a war hero. And see, this is what I don't get, Matt. L. Ron Hubbard lied when he didn't need to. Right. It was enough of an honor for any man or woman to have said, I served my country in World War II. Right. That was enough of an honor. I served my country. And I don't care what side you were on. The point is you served. Right. And Hubbard had to make himself a war hero. Yep. Medals that didn't exist. Yep. That's, to, that's to his discredit. And for people who, who, who idolize L. Ron Hubbard, they have to really look at both sides of the man, bad and good. Mm -hmm. True. Take the entire sweep of the man. And the church itself, the claims it was making has had to back down on. One of the original Dianetics claims is you will no longer need your glass eyeglasses after five hours of Dianetics auditing. Right. Not true. You routinely now see in magazines for, from Flag. And other places, OTs wearing Coke bottle glasses. Of course. And look, there are human frailties. People need glasses. You know, no big deal. Unless you're saying you won't need it and we need a million dollars from you. Right. Probably the most significant thing, though, I have seen in, it was, it was this past New Year's when Scientology aired its Super Bowl commercial and it showed the new E-meter, the, the Ultra Mark 8 meter. Right. Scientology... It almost sounded like lawyers wrote the commercial because it said higher spiritual states are possible. Right. That was carefully worded. It didn't say we're going to give them to you. It said it's possible. And now Scientology has been ground down to the language of the Internal Revenue Service of basically offering intangible spiritual benefits. Right. So we don't promise this anymore. And in fact, what I'm exposing on Scientology Money Project are these fake contracts where you hold the church harmless for anything up to and including death. Right. You hold them harmless for anything that'll happen. You agree not to sue them. You agree to arbitration, which is rigged. And you agree that 
the results that are obtained are completely your responsibility. So Matt, what I've discovered in the contract language is this. If I'm the church, I say to you, okay, give me $100,000, $150,000 now. This is what the founder said. Mm -hmm. However, whether or not you can attain the results completely on you, Matt Pesh, right. it's like, wait a minute, if it's all up to me, I'm going to keep my money and go do Buddhism. Right. Because at least it's cheaper and it's, you know, it's something more realistic. Right. That is, I can meditate, I can turn inward, I can be introspective. So I think there's a profound shift and, and the public exposure of what the church can and can't do, that's a good thing. Yeah, and I mean, that, I'll tell you something that was funny, you know, Flag talks about these L's and it'll take somebody and uh, make them this like super uh, management person and they will, their life will take off and skyrocket and they'll make all this kind of money, blah, blah, blah. Well, I'm like, okay, you look at the stats, we were sitting there as, you know, the executives of the FSO, and you pull the stats out for the last 10 years, and they're all downtrending across the board, and like steeply downtrending across the board. And you go, wow, you know, why don't we at least get the captain to do the L's? You know, she, we have our own right. orders. Why don't we have one of the orders take the captain? And why don't, if we really believe that this stuff works, how come we're not using it on our executives? And I was like, phew, attacked as enemy line. How can I be saying that? I mean, I was just asking, a, you know, a real question. I mean, shit, if, if this stuff is really that good, why don't we use it for our own people? That's astonishing. Yeah, if it's so good and it makes uh, the able more able. Yeah, I mean. Let's do it. Let's do it to our own executive staff so we boom the staff. Yeah, exactly. Now, you said that the long-term trend at Flag is downtrending. Yeah, I mean, uh, 2002, you go back to the late 80s. And I'm telling you, you lay those stats out. You know, it is about 28 major stats for the flag service organization. And you will see they're not just emergency trending, like a little bit down. They're danger trending. Really? Yes. Danger trending. Yes. So, and yet David Miscavige represents it as straight up in vertical expansion. Yeah, it, it just makes the shit up out of his butt. I mean, it has nothing to do with nothing. And then these little graphs he shows, it doesn't, doesn't show what he's comparing to what, what time period, it's nothing. It's just, and then, there, you know, there, you got booms and bangs in the background, you know, with music and people are clapping. And what the hell are you clapping about? You don't even know what you're talking about. I, I went to the 2007 New Year's Eve event mm -hmm. for the churches. That's the last public event I went to. And they invited me. You know, I attended. I went in a nice suit. Spent some money there on some books, whatever the release was. But what I noticed and, and what others have pointed out is that those stats David Miscavige represents are not really st statistics. What they are are icons. Right. They're graphics. Right. They are like a representation of what a statistic looks like, but they're not an actual statistic. Right. And then they flash by so fast at a live event with music that the old business saying, you know, if you can't baffle them with brilliance, buffalo them with bullshit. Right. That came to mind for me as a corporate guy. Now, come on. This, this isn't even trying. It's not even trying, Mr. Miscavige. Right. Uh, this is just pure nonsense. And I don't say that lightly, Matt. This, this, is, not, this is not honest to do with your parishioners. Right. It's not honest to engage in a dog and pony show with music that doesn't tell the truth. And I think that's the core problem with the church is it's dishonest with itself right. and its leader is dishonest. Exactly. I mean, and I'll tell you what, because FSO makes over half the money international and half the delivery, whatever is happening with the statistics of the FSO is what's happening with the statistics of Scientology International. It's a known fact. You know, if, if the money is down in the FSO, it's down internationally. If the book sales are up at flag, they're up internationally because it's it makes such a major part of the overall statistic, they can't help but follow what flag's doing. So if the FSO is downtrending over 10 years in a danger, internationally, it's downtrending in a danger. So as Rome goes, there goes the empire. Exactly. And the empire of Scientology appears to be crumbling in front of our eyes. Yeah, and you can see it. You're at flag, you can, I mean, you know, you can see it. Like I said, there would be 150 people outside the waiting area 25 years ago, and now you're going to see three, at, you know, three, two, one, nobody in there because it's just it's shrunk that much. Now, shifting gears, 
You mentioned that the free wins is a money loser. Right. Why do they keep a money loser operating? Because if you were to shut down the ship, it would make it so you could see as a Scientologist real clearly that Scientology was in trouble and was it was getting smaller. It would be out so, PR. So, so David Miscavige can't afford to shut down the free wins. Exactly. What is the free? What's it like to be on the free winds? What's the experience for you as a, a flag executive? Uh, I mean, you know, it's a it's a nice enough ship. It's got nice staff, you know. But it, you can see real clearly that the anxiety of trying to get people on that boat and to keep them there, to, you know, to try to make money enough so that they can, you know, pretend like they can at least contributing to the the amount of money it takes to run that ship, you know, there's a lot of anxiety on, like you see in other organizations, but it, it seems to be even more dramatic, maybe because it's such close quarters of the, the need to get public, the need to get uh, money. Matt, so this is, the, the Free Winds, is, is it called the Flagship Service Organization, FSSO? Yeah, it's supposed to be like Flag Big Sister or something. You know? And on the flagship, they deliver the highest level uh, new OT8? Right. But to your point, uh, publics hide in their hotel rooms at flags so they don't get wrecked. Right. Does the basic same thing happen on the ship? If you're trapped on the ship for a week, you're going to get wrecked all the time. Oh, yeah, you're going to get wrecked all the time. Yeah, you know, you, you know, you got to figure the ship got so desperate at one time that it was selling OT9 and OT10 without having any idea what that would even be. Like, is that something that would take two weeks? Is that something that would take 20 years? You know, they had not, because there is no such thing as OT9 and 10, they obviously had no concept of what it could be. Yet, they were so desperate to try to get money that they actually sold millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of OT9 and 10. Well, these people who had done OT8, when they were told they had to go back on OT7, meant they had to go back to FLAG and do services. And what we did at FLAG and me, what I did as a Tresec, we took paper transfer of that credit from the free winds over to flag and delivered service against money that was given to the free winds years earlier. You know what I'm saying? So basically we were given free service. Oh, it sounds like a shell game almost. It was a shell game. I mean, we had to cover their ass basically because these public were all upset that they were sold, that they had given, you know, a hundred grand for OT nine and 10, which never materialized. And now they're being told they never really finished OT seven. And they have to go back and do it. And they're like, well, shit, you guys already have my money on the free wins. You know, what's the deal? So, you know, you got to keep them quiet. These are the key people in the Scientology. So you, you say, I'll tell you what, the 100000 that you used to have on the free wins, you now have it on your, your flag service organization account. So go do what you need to do. Oh, that is just, that's just unbelievable story. But true in the, in the uh, surreal world of Scientology where down is up and up is down, black is white, yep. etc. Yep. When you look at the overall flag experience, what do you think they're what do you think they're down to income wise? What's your ballpark feeling per month I don't know. these days? I have no idea really. I've been out of there for almost ten years. I have no idea what it is, but I can guess that whatever it is, the individuals on the average are paying a lot more than they used to. <laughs> what happens is like less fish in the bowl. So you need only to keep the, trying to keep the bigger fish in there and get them, you know, to give up more. So. Yeah, that's it in a nutshell. Matt, it's great having you on the show. You are a wealth of information. I'll tell you one other yeah. thing. Kind of yeah, what please. We're talking, about. We're talking about, you know, yeah. Scientology claims to be the experts on the human mind and, you know, we should get rid of psychiatry and obliterate them and blah, 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 blah. This but the truth is, as soon as a staff member or a public person has a psychotic break, which is fairly often, there's money set aside to get that person out of there immediately. And these people are just usually dropped on the doorstep, literally dropped on the doorstep of some relative or friend who's not even a Scientologist and left there. And, and that's like, whew, you know, we've got that. So let me, let me get this straight. If you go type three... Yeah have a psychotic break at flag you're off the base in minutes yeah i mean it might they might have to you know if you're screaming yelling and stuff like that they might take a little bit of time to get it to the point where you're you can be stuck on an airplane or some kind of public transport without you know causing a whole kerfuffle you you just you know still think that there's a you know a, 
a Martian in your wallet or something like that, and they will get some guy to try to you know drug you up a bit and get somebody to escort you on their the public transport to get you away from Flag to drop you off literally on somebody's doorstep so that it's somebody else's problem. So I mean, what, who's going to take care of all the crazy people in the world if you get rid of psychiatry? I mean, I'm, I'm, they're not experts. They're not not perfect. But at least these people are trying. Scientology won't touch that stuff. So what are they talking about? No, and you said is, is it known in the uh, is it known in the upper strata of flag that they use drugs to cool people out who've had psychotic breaks? Yeah, I mean it, it's it's known. I mean a lot of staff they don't really know what the hell's going on. Period, and they've never dealt with uh, a psychotic break or whatever. But people who have been around for a while, yeah, they know that. Is there like a medicine cabinet at flag where the drugs are hidden to you know give people something if they flip out? I don't know. If it's kept on a base or whether they just use different, you know, there's different Scientology medical people in the field around flag that they could get the drugs from or whatever, you know, whatever way they do it, they get it. And these people are put on sedatives or whatever to calm them down enough and so they can be exported out without, you know, screaming the holy Jesus. <laughs> yeah, because a psychotic would be out PR. Right. And Scientology doesn't want some crazy person on the base. And they certainly do not want to repeat of Lisa McPherson. Right. Well, Matt, we're we're uh, at our hour. I would like to keep the show. I'd like to keep the show going, but I want to have you back on the show and change subjects. Great. Because I want to get into specifics of some other things, you know, related to other topics. I appreciate the overview of flag service organization, the regging process, hard sales. It really confirms what so many people have said. And I think the power of radio is that you actually get to hear the real people who are there doing it. And people love the details of how Scientology actually works on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. So thank you so much for being on the show. And we'll have you back soon. We do want your better half, Amy Scobie, on the show. Oh, yeah, we'll have to get her on. And anytime Please you want to talk about something, just let me know what the subject is, and uh, we'll, we'll do it. Oh, I've got you on my speed dial. <laughs> <I'm not>. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. We're available online at survivingscientologyradio.com, on YouTube at Surviving Scientology, and on iTunes. Thank you for listening. As always, we'll be in very good touch.